Hey, we're right in the middle of a series called Stuff the Church Does. I know that's a real creative title. It was uh, just my way of explaining some things that the church does that maybe you've never even thought about it. Like, why does the church do this? Why do they sing? Why do we even go to church? And we've been covering things like that. And today I want to continue on in that. But I want to, I want to start uh, with, with kind of a, a question. Uh, and I, let me start first with a statement, actually. Here's, here's what I want to do today, all right? Uh, if today I had a goal or a topic, it would be this. I want to help you think about you. Now, for some of you, you think about you maybe too much. It's okay. You can laugh. That's... For others of you, maybe you don't think about you that much. People have maybe even said that. You hardly even think about yourself. But I want to help you think about you. So today, for the first time ever, you know, where it's like actually, actually okay, I just want to give you permission. Like, I want you to think about you for a minute, all right? So today I want to help you think about you by describing you and some parts of you that maybe you haven't even thought about. There's several different parts of you. The first part of you that I want to help you think about today is I want you to think about the public you. All of you have a public you. You have a part of you that says, I know this, and you obviously know this. The public you obviously knows that you're wearing a blue shirt today that I really liked while ago that I said I like how the material feels very soft when we hugged. Um, there's, the, there's the public you, right? It's the part of you that people see and they know. It's the part of you that people experience when they get you at the coffee shop or Starbucks or the grocery store. They can see you're wearing cool shoes or they can see you've got a little kid with you. It's, it's the public you. It's the part of you that's on display like 99.9% of the time. So here's a question or just something kind of to think about. And it's this. What do people think about when they think about you? Have you thought about that? Have you thought about what? what people think about when they think about me. Do they like me? Do they think my shoes are cool? Do I look like a good mom? Do I look like a good dad? Do I look like a good Christian? So what do people think about when they think about you? Or what do you want people to think about when they think about you? Have you ever thought about that? Like when people think about you, what do you want them to think about when they think about you? Well, there's some things I want you to think about me when you think about me. There's a few things that I'm sure you want people to think about you when you think about you. Maybe when people think about the public you, you would love for them to think about you and say, that guy is a really hard worker. Works really hard. Rise and grind, everybody. I mean, when I look at that guy, I'm like, he's living the dream. You'd love for people to think you're an amazing dad, right? You're an amazing mom, a great mom. You've got it all together. There's nothing going on in your life. There's no flaws. I mean, everything is perfect. You would love for people to think you're successful and fun and pretty and smart and talented. And I'm sure if you're in this room, one of the things you would love for people to think when they think about you is you're a really good Christian. You got it together. You read your Bible and you even post about it, right? Right next to the perfect coffee. <laughs> See, what do you think about when you think about you? And what do you want people to think about when they think about you? This is the public you. And the thing about the public you is this, and maybe you've never really thought about it, but the public you, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok, they reward the public, I mean, perfect you. Isn't it true that so much of our culture, digitally especially, what are they rewarding when they think about you? They're rewarding not just the public you, the thing that we all see, but they're, they're rewarding the perfect you. I saw a video yesterday on Instagram, and it was a guy talking about videos and reels and like, you know, how to go viral and make all the money you could think of. And it says, here's the thing, you gotta be excellent. Like 90% of the time, you gotta be perfect. And if you are perfect, people will like you and follow you and comment about you. See, there's a world that doesn't just want the public you, they want the perfect you. But how many of you know there is no perfect you? You know why there's no perfect you? Because you know this, and I may not know this about you, but you know there's a private you. See, there's a public you. It's what I think about when I think about you and see when we interact. But there is a private you. There is a part of you that you know that I don't know. That quite honestly, you don't want me to know, I'm sure. All of us have a private you. All of us have a side of us that doesn't always quite measure up to the public you. 
Anybody have a private you that doesn't measure up to the public you? Meaning this, maybe the public you wants people to think you're smart and talented and successful, but there is a private you that is struggling at your job. And there's a private you that's on the brink of divorce. And there's a private you that just yelled at your kids on the way to church. And there's a private you that can't sleep. There's a private you that's anxious, maybe stressed. Maybe there's a private you that feels distant from God, not close to God. It's a private you that maybe feels addicted. Maybe you are, whatever the addiction is, a private you that doesn't feel pretty but feels ugly, never measuring up. And the thing about the private you like the you that you know, I'm not talking about the you that other people see where they're like, hey, you got a booger, you know, or whatever. I'm talking about the private you that like puts a mask on and says, I'm never letting anyone see this. The private you, you know what it wants to do? It really wants to protect the public you. The public you that says, I've got to look a certain way. I've got to act a certain way because if they really knew this about me, if they really understood what was going on on the inside and what happens when the private you and the public you, there's like a gap in between, there's distance in between those and they're not lining up. And that's all of us, by the way. We all have a side of us that we try to hide and cover and protect. What happens is we really become an imaginary you. See, when the private you and the public you doesn't always line up, then what you do in public is you become the imaginary you. It's the you that you wish you were. It's the you that you want other people to think you are. It's the you that acts like you have it all together and comes to church and somebody says, are you good? And you're like, I'm fine. But you know the private you is like on the list that I talked about a minute ago. We can see it in your eyes. We can... See it in how you walk. But it's like, no, I just, the imaginary me, I'm going to create that world. Because if people really knew what I was like, people really knew what I was like, wouldn't they, wouldn't they not like me? Wouldn't they judge me? Would they think less of me? You know what I've learned about imaginary you? is imaginary you can be exhausting. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you're in a place where like public you and private you has created this like, there's such a gap and so you put on a facade. You've created an image. And we all do that and you know why we do it? Because we wanna protect and we we wanna cover and we wanna pretend and we wanna hide because we don't want people to see the real us. But when we do find people that see the real us, by the way, here's what we do, right? And you've been there before. You've gotten a group and you finally let your wall down. You know, you finally took the mask off and maybe it was a fringe group. Maybe it was somebody at your job or it was a hobby that you were in or, you know, this this group over here on the other side or maybe you just had one too many to drink one night and the mask came down and all of a sudden you did that and you took off the mask and then you know you just felt that weight drop and then you said something like this those people are for real because they get me they understand me and maybe it wasn't that they were for real maybe it was just the first time you were real the first time you took off the mask and said I'm tired of pretending and you know where we do this the most I mean, you saw it coming, right? But it doesn't make it any less true. We walk in the doors. We thought if they really knew me, they wouldn't accept me. They wouldn't like me. They would judge me. And so the very vehicle the very, whatever you want to call it, establishment, organization, church, body, family that you are meant to thrive in and be the real you in. We protect and we cover and we hide. 
And it's not just our sins, but it's our feelings. It's the things that we're struggling with on the inside. But when I look at the church, I don't see, I don't see a family in which we're supposed to protect and hide and run. But we've had that problem since the very beginning, by the way. I mean, in Genesis chapter, you know, one, two, and three, we see this creation story and we see Adam and Eve and we see them eating, you know, of the tree and all of a sudden there's sin and sin enters the picture and God shows up and what do they do? They run, they hide, they try to protect. God's like, where are you? But they're filled with shame. God didn't create that. It wasn't what he wanted. He wanted them to be in relationship. But imaginary you that forms because of private you always wants to hide, always wants to isolate. And so it's so easy to happen in church, but what if church was the one place you shouldn't have to be fake you, but you could be the real you because in church we're supposed to forgive one another and restore one another and to accept one another and to carry one another's burdens and to care for one another and to bear with one another and to encourage one another. And the one another's in scripture could go on and on and on. This is the one place that you ought to come and be the real you because you know when I come, they're going to forgive me. They're going to accept me. They're going to restore me. They're not going to judge me. It's not going to be they don't like me. No, this is a safe place where I can be me. What if church was the place that you could drop the imaginary you and just say, here's the real me. See, I found that the real you, man, it comes alive in the context of godly relationships. There's something about getting around godly people who will love you and forgive you and bear with you and encourage you that when you take the mask off with those kind of people, man, it's like we begin to thrive. And the real you becomes alive. And it's like a weight comes off you. And you've tried it before. I know you have. Maybe not consistently, but you've been in a moment where somebody, and you said something, and you, you took the mask off for a moment, and it was like a weight came off of you. What if this is how we're really supposed to live? So my challenge today is church is dying for the real you. You don't have to be the imaginary you. You don't have to be the you that you want people to think about when they think about you. No, you can be the real you. One of the ways in which we create vehicles for that here is small groups. Liz talked about it. Today I have a goal, and it's for 100% of you, to get involved in relationship and the real you begin to thrive. Because this matters. And I would love for it all to happen in this room. I would love for this room to be the one place that you could just be you, the real you, all the time. But in order for me to do that, I'd probably have to stand you all up right now. Say, all right, go to your neighbor. Tell him your secrets. <laughs> we don't have time for that. You don't want that. It'd be a little awkward on a Sunday. I mean, imagine if I came up here right now and I was like, hey, y'all, I had a bad week the other day and really, I would have rather been golfing than preaching. I mean, you don't want me to start my sermon like that. But isn't it true that I need somebody to tell that to? I can't keep that. You can't keep the thing that's inside of you that honestly wants to pull you down. I mean, you've heard it said, right? You're only as sick as your secrets. I'm not talking about like the secret sins. I'm just talking about the secret things that keep you up at night that you're handling on your own. And so it's making you anxious and stressed and worried. And I think that's why Hebrews says this, by the way. Hebrews says, so let us hold unswervingly to the hope that we profess for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider, let us think about, we read this last week, how we can spur one another on towards love and good deeds, not giving up, meeting, everyone read that word? Together. together. There's power in together. Let us consider how we can love and encourage and be 
together in the book of Acts, I see this word played out over and over, especially in the first church. As I look at the first church in Acts chapter 2, we see that they devoted themselves to the teaching and to the preaching and fellowship and the breaking of bread and to prayer. And so all the things that we know is going to grow us as disciples. All the things that we know are going to help us grow in our faith. I mean, listening to the word of God and prayer and being devoted to one another and breaking of bread, all of these things. And it says when they did that, they were all filled with awe and many signs were performed and wonders were performed by the apostles and all the believers were... And all the believers were and had everything in common and they sold property and possessions and they gave to anyone that had a need and every day they continued to meet. And in the temple courts, they broke bread in their homes and they, I mean, there's like a theme when I look at the first church and it was just together and what I'm finding out is now more than ever together matters. When I think about the church and when I think about the family of God and when I think about How the buildings that we're in are more than just the church, right? We talked about that last week. The church is more than a building. The building just simply brings us together. It allows us to have a place where we can be together. And so I thank God for this space. But it's not just about the stage. It's about creating a container in which we can be together. We can be a family And you need a Sunday morning, but you also need something so much more than that because the odds are on a Sunday morning, it's so easy to come in the door, maybe hug, maybe do what I said last week, encourage, pray, and all that, but just go right out to the car because Sundays, for whatever reason, because it's so quick and we're turning over the services and there's another, you know, people are coming in, you you know, parking and all of that, we're probably not going to take time to break down and say this is what's going on. But we need that. We need house to house. We need coffee shops. We need places where we can sit down and just take off the mask. And so I just think together matters now more than ever. And so I want to talk about some benefits real quick of together. Number one, I think this together fights off loneliness. Loneliness. In 2024, I am surprised by how many people are living in isolation. We're more connected than ever. We have more digital followers than ever, but they're really not friends. We call them friends because I think the enemy, Satan, honestly, has, has, has so desired for us to have a counterfeit of what true friendship is, which is this. And so we call them friends, but they're counterfeit friends. They're not friends. They're not even acquaintances. They're followers. But how many friends do you have that you'll never meet, that you'll never take off the mask with, that you're never going to get real with? There's got to be more to friends than likes and comments. So I think we're living in a world of isolation and now more than ever. We know people, we're connected to people, but we're still in isolation. I mean, I've met so many men and women that have said, I... I, I just, I'm connected, but I really don't have any friends. I think about my dad. We talked before, and he's like, yeah, I just don't have a lot of friends. I'm like, how is that true in 2024? But you understand that. And we don't need like 100, but we all need one or two. We all need somebody we can take the mask off. We all need somebody we can get real with. But man, all culture fights against it. Our time fights against it. Social media fights against it. And so we have a world that's living in isolation, even though there are people all around us and we're more than connected. I think about how, how, how it must grieve God to see his, his body, his creation in isolation. You know, in Genesis chapter one, he makes the heavens and the earth. He looks at him, he says, oh, they're so, they're, they're great. It's like, I mean, God is bragging on himself, which I would too if I created all this, you know. He's like, man, I, that, is, that is good. He makes man, he's like, man, that's, that's my best right there. Very good. But then he's like, oh, 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 oh. He looks at man, he's like, something's wrong. And everything has been good up until this point. Everything that God created, he says, that is good. And then he makes man, 
Even though man is good, he looks at man and for the first time he introduces something is not good. He says, then the Lord God said, it is not good. Why? Because man is alone. So what did he do? He made a helper for him. He made Eve. He said, no, 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 no. My, my creation must live in relationship. You think about the Trinity, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. There has always existed community and relationship. And so he looked at man and he said, man can't be alone. Man can't even be fruitful alone. What does man need to be fruitful? He looked at him and he said, now that you're together, what? Be fruitful and multiply. It would take a husband and a wife to be fruitful and multiply. But I think the same is true for us. It is hard for us to be fruitful by ourselves. There's power in relationships. There's power in togetherness. There's power. And so the enemy wants to isolate us. Ecclesiastes, really Solomon, the wisest man that ever lived. Ecclesiastes, it's the book of the pastor. In fact, it opens up saying this, the, the teacher, the teacher to the church to, or to the teacher to the Ecclesiastes, son of David, Solomon says this, says there was a man all alone. When a man was all alone, he neither had son nor brother. There was no end to his toil. It goes on to say, even his eyes weren't content with his wealth. So he had everything that the world thought he needed, but he was alone. It said when there was a man on alone, no brother, no friend, no relationship. There was no end to his toil. In other words, he was miserable. And so what togetherness does, man, simply put, when we invest in friendship, when we invest in godly community, when we say this is not just a church that I attend, but this is a family I can belong to. I'm a part of God's family, and I am meant to be together. Together fights off isolation. Together fights off loneliness. And there should never be somebody in a church lonely because God's plan is together. The second is this, together helps you grow. I mean, man, there's some men in this room that I, I, I'm looking at, that I have had coffee with, that I have sat down with, and as I look you in the eyes and I'm thinking about, man, what you've invested in me, man, I am better because of some men in this room. I am better because of coffees and lunches and, you know, time I've had with them where they poured into me and poured into me as a dad and, you know, as a, as a husband and as, you know, we sharpened one another. There's something about a relationship, a godly relationship, man, that has helped me me grow. And if you think about the relationships in your own life, the times you've let godly people in your life, you've probably grown as well. Ephesians says this, it says he makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special works, it helps the other parts grow. See, as the body becomes the body and we each do what God has gifted us to do, we talked about that last week, we grow. We grow so that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. Proverbs says this, as iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. I thank God for the friends that have sharpened me. The friends that have said, hey, you don't know this about you, but I know this about you because I've been watching you. And it's not, you're not okay. How you said that, how you did that, how you looked, that wasn't cool. We need those people, by the way. Everybody needs somebody that can tell you, you need to be called. What did Alyssa say this week in staff meeting? Hey, I'm not going to put you down. I'm going to call you up. We all need somebody that won't put us down, but to call us up. You got anyone that's calling you up? We need it. First Thessalonians says this. It says, therefore, encourage one another and build each other up. Y'all, there is power when you invite men and women who love God into your life and let them build you up. Let them encourage you. It matters together, not only fights off isolation and grows us, I also think it helps me in times of adversity. There's something about having a brother when I'm in need. Something about having a, having a friend in times of trial. A friend loves at all times and a brother is born for time, uh, and a brother is born for a time of adversity. It's powerful, it's powerful when you know that you got somebody that can get your back. If we look at Ecclesiastes, there's this, 
passage of scripture, it's often used in weddings and it talks about how two are better than one for they help each other succeed. And then it goes on to say this, if one person falls when there's two together, there's somebody else that can reach out and help. But someone who falls alone is in real trouble. Man, we, we need to be together. We need community, not just a spouse, but you need friendships. You need somebody that can say, I get it, man. I know it feels like the sun's not coming up again tomorrow. You do not hear any singing. Sun will come up tomorrow. It doesn't feel like that. But I got you. I know you're weak. I know you're discouraged. Lean on me. Let me pray for you. Do you have anyone that cares enough about you that they will write down a prayer for you? got people that God have started putting in my life that literally when I give them prayer requests, they write them down and they pray for me. Do you have that? It's not just going to happen. You'll have to invest in it. You'll have to maybe take off a mask and not just, not just live the public you, but be a real you. It takes a real you to say, this is what I need prayer for. I think the last is this. So not only together can help you grow and fight off isolation and help in times of trouble, I think it also just helps you beat sin. I mean, he who is without sin, just go ahead and cast the first stone, right? I mean, isn't it true that we all make mistakes? Every one of you has something you're probably dealing with. And I, I, I see this very powerful scripture in the book of James that... I mean, we kind of talked about a minute ago. Confess your sins one to another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. I mean, it's powerful. It doesn't say so that you may be forgiven because I can't forgive you. I, I literally cannot forgive you. Only Christ can forgive you. So the beautiful thing is that Jesus came and he died on a cross so that when you receive that, his love, his forgiveness, you make him Lord of your life, you can walk in forgiveness. You can live in victory over sin when you allow Christ. You know what I mean? But I can have victory over sin. I can be forgiven, but still have the weight of sin heavy in my life. I mean, there have been times where I've struggled and I'm like, man, I know I'm good. I know God doesn't hate me. I know he's forgiven me, but there's a weight that's on me. There's a burden I'm carrying. It's something about like going and telling a friend. It's like when you let it go. And as a pastor, I've seen it a hundred times. And it's like they sit down. They let it go and they let it off their chest. And you know what happens? men and women alike most of the time. It's like tears start to stream down their face. It's not like a sadness. It's like a relief. It's like the tears, they begin to flow because it's like, I finally felt like I let it off my chest. I finally feel like it's just, and you know what they're saying and they may never known this. And, and, and now you know, by the way, is what it is, what's happening is you're becoming the real you. It's like you've been living the imaginary you for so long and it's exhausting. And when you tell somebody, the healing comes because you're the real you now. And I have found and I have heard counselors over and over talk about this is vulnerability. Your willingness to just take off the mask and say, I'm not okay. Vulnerability is the gateway, meaning it opens the door to togetherness. Man, there's something that will build a friendship. You want to build a great godly friendship? Get real with somebody. But, I mean, all of hell, to be honest with you, is fighting against that. I mean, all of hell and all of his, you know, demons and people under his influence, he does not want you to do that because sin always demands to have it. You know, it wants you by itself. It wants to keep you isolated from others. And so what happens when you like, you know, when you mess up, you know what you normally do? I don't know if you've ever done this, but we all know somebody that's done this, right? They mess up and what do they do like the very next week? They're like, oh, I can't go to church this week. 
what cause is that? The very thing that you're supposed to go to and feel forgiveness and encouraged and strengthened and edified and built up. No, sin comes and instead of, why? Because there's a real enemy that wants to demand to have you to itself. It's like, yeah, 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 come over here because if they knew the real you, they wouldn't like you. They would judge you. They would criticize you. We got to drop the mask and stop pretending. See confession to one another. And I'm not saying, again, it's like, I'm not like, all right, stand up. I'm not even saying you have to do it in your small group, but you need to do it with someone. I'm not saying every small group should be this thing where it's like, all right, we're all just sharing our sins together. But there's probably someone in that group you can get real with. Probably someone in that group you can say, hey, can we go grab coffee? I just, I I need somebody. See, you can drop the public you that's creating this imaginary you that you care so much about what people think when they think about you, that you've become a false you and you can, you can live the, the real you and confession with one another brings healing. Confession, I think, breaks the power of sin because it does so in the safety of a community that I hope and pray mirrors God's love. I hope and pray when you take off the mask and when you confess, the reason why it breaks that power in your life is because when you look at them and when you take off the mask, you're like, man, those people love me like Jesus. Man, I felt encouraged. Man, I felt built up. Man, I felt like I could go to hell with a water pistol and extinguish all the flames now. I mean, I'm like, I'm ready to go. C.S. Lewis says this. It says a friendship Friendship is born the moment when one person says to another, you too? Like, huh? My son makes his face now, huh? Like, what? You too? I thought I was the only one. I've seen it happen in groups, by the way, where somebody, it's like usually three or four weeks in, right? And it's like they were holding it I've seen it time and time. It's like they were holding it in. It's like every week they wanted to, you know? It's just like, oh, not this week, because what are they going to think if they knew that about me? And it's like finally it gets so heavy or it becomes so safe or finally there's some sort of moment. And it's like the group wasn't even about that, and they just dropped it. And then you know what happens? It's like one after another. Usually it's like, it may not happen right there in the moment because everyone's like, oh, did he really go there? But then it's like, wow, hey, thank you for sharing that because me too. So here's what I want to ask you to do. I want to ask you to do something and listen, I just like start getting your courage up now, all right? So I'm gonna ask that 100% of you will participate in one of the three things that I'm about to give you. Not to do them all, I get it. But just one, one, all right? Because you need this. The real you needs this. Three things that you can do today to get together. Number one, join a small group. When you leave today, we're gonna give you a QR code. So almost 30 groups that meet all throughout the city, all different times of the week, men's, women's, marrieds, join a group. Get in godly community. Get in godly community and say, you know what? I I need friendship. I want to grow. And here's what I can promise you. Like we have done our very best. I mean, I got all the small group leaders together uh, last week. And I just, I'm like, all right, this Sunday, I'm going to do my very, very best to talk about the reason why this matters. And here's what I need from you. As leaders, I need you to take this seriously. As leaders, here's what I'm, here's what I'm asking you to do. Some of you, your leaders in the room, and just to reiterate again, I said, hey, will you, will you be the most encouraging place they've ever been? 
When somebody signs up for a group, may your home, may your coffee shop, may wherever you gather, may it be so encouraging that people are like floored, like, oh my gosh, these people are weird. They're so kind and nice and open. May just be that kind of encouraging place. Will you share scripture? May scripture be a part of it. Will you pray for each other? I took it a step further and I said to all the small group leaders, I said, hey, if somebody takes the time to get in your small group, I'm asking you to do this. I'm asking you to pray by name daily for every person in your group. If you're gonna lead a group, that's all I'm asking you to do. You don't have to be a perfect group leader, have all the great content, all of that. Even if your food sucks at your group, do this, you know? Pray every day by name for the people in your group. And then I want you to help them take next steps. I want you to care enough about their walk with God that you help them in areas they're weak. So we made it real memorable. We just said ESPN, encourage, scare, scripture, prayer, next steps. So my promise to you is I have done everything I can to prepare the leaders for you. So you could be the real you. Maybe you're on the fence about this. You're new to the church. You're like, I, I don't know if I'm there yet. In the last couple of weeks, maybe you've walked in and you've seen somebody at church. You thought, I kind of like them. Like the way, they, we just kind of chatted on the walk to the car. I kind of like them. We, we found ourselves this week at, you know, two minutes to mingle, kind of mingling again. If you have anybody here that you thought, I kind of like them, exchange numbers with them. Just get somebody's number today, but don't just get their number. Go have coffee with them. Share a meal with them. Meet on lunch break. Or number three, invite someone over to your house to share a meal. This week, invite a godly friend. Invite somebody in this church over to your house. Share a meal with them. Be the real you. Now, you're going to have to have a couple meals because you know what? Nobody's going to be real on the first meal. So I would encourage you, like, do a meal every so often, maybe every other week, once a month, but make time for something. Everyone can exchange a number and call someone. Everyone can have someone over to your house, and everyone could join a small group. This is important because Hebrew says we ought to consider how we, how we think about this. That we're to spur each other on, remember? Not giving up, meeting together. Together is God's plan. And so I leave with two questions. Have you given up meeting together? Like I, I kind of tried a small group one time, but they let me down. Kind of tried a small group one time, but I got busy and I'm even more busy now. I get it. That's why we've tried to create enough groups with enough different topics that hopefully they're just doing something you already love doing that you're already doing. Or maybe the question is, have you ever met together? And if you've never met together, it's time to come out of isolation and be the real you. Imaginary you doesn't really have time for this. Imaginary you can give me a list of excuses. And while imaginary you doesn't have time for this, the real you needs this. So here's my prayer for you. My, my prayer is you would put to grave the imaginary you. Decide, I'm going to be the real me in the place that matters the most. C.S. Lewis. Was it Charles Spurgeon? Charles Spurgeon last week. The quote was this, the church is the dearest place to me. May the church be the dearest place to you because it's the one place that you can be the real you. Would you bow your heads all over this room? Father, we thank you so much. 
I thank you that you have created us with the incredible ability to be in community. That you've allowed community to be the place in which we could thrive. Father, I pray that you would continue to grow us together as a family, as a body. Maybe you're in here today with every head bowed, every eyes closed. The community that you'd so desperately need is a relationship with you and Jesus Christ. That you don't just need a friend in this room, but you need a friend that sticks closer than a brother. Jesus says he is that friend. He will never leave you. He will never forsake you. He has always been fighting for you. And he drew you here today because he loves you. The Bible says it's his loving kindness that draws you to a place of repentance. What is repentance? It's simply saying, God, I'm sorry for doing life on my own, but I'm turning towards you. If you are lacking a relationship with God, I'm telling you something will come alive in you. It's not just about heaven being your home, while that in and of itself should be enough. It's about realizing you will never be living on all six cylinders, never be living the life that God has for you until you're synced up with him. If you've never given your life to Christ, I'm going to give you an opportunity to do so. Nobody looking around, every head bowed, every eye closed. Today you would say, that's me. I need to give my life to Christ today. Would you just slip up your hand no matter where you are? I'd love to pray over you. I'm going to call you out, single you, judge you. Father, I thank you. I pray that you would grow us, bind us together. I pray, God, that we would have a church of people that no longer pretend and cover and hide, but become the real versions of themselves that you've created them to be. Can we drop the mask? And can we... Can we get together? Because now more than ever, together matters. In Jesus' name, amen.